Okay, well, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, April uh, edition of the uh, um, RASC meeting, the Ottawa RASC meeting. Uh, before we get started tonight, I wanted to say a quick thank you to Paul Clowinger, uh, who chaired the, uh, the last meeting. I, uh, I appreciate that. I wasn't able to attend. That was, of course, the meeting with uh, Haley Sapers here. And uh, lots of good feedback about that meeting, and, and particularly also from Haley as well, our, our, our speaker, who said she thoroughly enjoyed the meeting. So thanks to, uh, thanks to Paul, and thanks to uh, everyone who attended as well. I really appreciate that. Um, if, what I'd like to do first before we get started here is just a quick poll of uh, who's, uh, maybe just with hands, uh, who's, who's here for the first time tonight? Okay. Okay. Uh, there's uh, a, couple of, a couple of new folks. That's, 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 uh, that, that's welcome. It's, uh, that's, that's a wonderful welcome. Uh, what, uh, we're, we're really uh, fortunate today because we've got tons of stuff that uh, we're going we're gonna to share with uh, everyone here. There's lots of announcements about recreational astronomy events or uh, astronomy outreach events. Um, we've got um, presentation, I think two presentations which might be, I, I always say this and you're probably right, it's getting tired of me saying this, but um, two presentations I think might be the finest of the year, all right, as you'll see. And um, uh, well researched and um, very well organized as well. So you, you, I think, you think you'll see that with, uh, with Tim Cole's presentation on um, celestial navigation and, um, and uh, Jim Thompson's on, uh, on the, the sort of history of the mapping of the, of the, of the moon. Very, very nice, uh, very nice what they've done with it, their own little um, perspective and, uh, and um, their you can see their interests are, 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 are in, or they've added to the presentation. Um, in addition to that, we've got uh, something really special here. So one of our, um, one of our members, uh, Jim Sophia, um, went to uh, Whitehorse recently, right? And um, Fairbanks. Fairbanks. Oh, I always get it wrong. Fairbanks, Alaska. Okay, Fairbanks, Alaska. So about two weeks ago, was it? There was uh, there was uh, some auroras. I think that uh, you, most people probably heard about through the uh, through the media, and I'm sure some of you actually saw it. You're going to see some uh, images tonight. Jim was uh, in uh, in like Aurora Central, so uh, he's going to be sharing some uh, images that he took. And um, well, I'll tell more about it later. I don't want to I don't wanna let him tell more about it as well. So some amazing uh, images um, and, and a video too that we're going to share. Uh, Neil Rollins is standing in for Al Scott on the 10 minute astronomy uh, segment and he'll, I think you'll find that also packed with uh, lots of stuff. Uh, door prizes for again for those folks who are new uh, are here tonight uh, we've got uh, lots of uh, door prizes. You don't have to be a member to, uh, to, um, to uh, receive a door prize. During the break, we have our raffle tickets. You pick up a raffle ticket, and at the end of the meeting, uh, we call it. We select the pull the raffle tickets out of our, our box here, and uh, if your number is called, you can uh, pick up a prize at the front. Uh, I wanted to say thank you, by the way, to the. We have got a ton of door prizes. So many of them that I can't get them all out tonight because we'd be here till till midnight. But um, very generous of um, of uh, everyone to. To, to do this, so, so, th so thank you for doing that. I know last meeting was, incre I, I, was a huge amount of um, door prize. This meeting is the same thing here. I'm, I'm almost kind of dreading taking it back home and, my, and some of it back home in my car because it's, it's quite a bit. So folks, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident you're gonna enjoy it tonight. There's, there's, a, there's a lot here um, and, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, you'll see that the presenters have put a lot of e effort into it. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move to the next slide here. Okay, I think I talked about that. Let's go on to the next one. Next slide, please. Okay, we, we kind of like to start with humor, or at least what we like to think is humor here. So uh, on the left there is, uh, I guess, what you would see uh, through, a, um, through, a, through a telescope and a bit of imaging as well. Um, uh, in our field, there's a lot of people with science backgrounds and, and engineering backgrounds. So uh, um, say they, uh, I guess somebody was uncomfortable with the, uh, what appears to be a disorganized image on the left and they organized it on the right uh, in, in nice columns and so forth. So, um, anyhow. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, I'll just let you read this one here. We, we, we get these contributed by members here. Okay. Next, next one. Okay, so just a couple things here uh, for the uh, new, since the last month, uh, some new members here: uh, Antonella Chester, Ian Frost, Jean Sebastien, and Peter uh, Timbrel. Are, are any of you here tonight? Sorry, I heard a yes. Okay, well, awesome. Well, welcome. Thank, thanks for coming. I hope you, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, we do give membership cards uh, as part of the uh, membership. And uh, Art Fraser, he's um, Art and Anne serve uh, refreshments uh, after the meeting. Art can uh, give you your, your membership card as well. Um, next slide, please. 
Okay, members in the news, there's quite a bit here, so I want to go fairly quickly here. Um, because I really want to get to the presentations as fast as possible. So um, in, re in a recent Ottawa Metro, there was a mention of uh, a fellow David Johnson here, okay, and there was a reference to the uh, Ottawa RESC. Now, anybody know David uh, Johnson? Does that name ring a bell to, uh, to anyone? Okay, well, um, now, this... In fact, Dave doesn't know about us because I was on CBC with him in the studio. Okay. He didn't, didn't even know about the RESC. Strange. Okay, actually, Gary, I heard you that that uh, that morning or whatever it was, um, and, and I was wondering who he was. Okay, okay, this is good. This is good. So that, that's that fellow. Okay, so next slide, please. So obviously, here is a ref. This, and this is all, of course, about the um, the auroras that were uh, that uh, were very prominent. Uh, uh, I guess uh, two weeks ago, it looks like uh, just over two weeks. And there's, of course, a reference to uh, to Gary. Next slide. Um, the Cerebolas, of course, with the um, Sculptor uh, Galaxy, that's, a, that's in the uh, April, um, the April uh, um, image for the, uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our RASC calendars, which, by the way, I still have a few of them available here. I think uh, we're probably going to have to discount the, discount the price of those calendars for, and probably throw in a, a large pizza as well. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Okay, so skill testing question here, and we're gonna, um, the prize here goes to, to um, the person who can identify what language this is, and I think the prize will be um, a gently used, uh, Attila's a gently used 25 inch daub, okay, that he's probably not gonna use very much anymore, so. But, um, okay, so I guess I can't divide the prize out of mine, but amongst five, five, six of you that uh, I guessed it was finished. Well, well, well done, well done. Okay, actually then, you have to help me out here. Okay, how do you pronounce it? That, uh, this magazine? Eric, does that do it? Very good. So er Eric uh, um, is, uh, is, is also a, a Finnish uh, as well. So, and, um, so this is a magazine that has a, um, it's a, a, it's a, 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 it's astronomy magazine in Finland here with, um, Eric tells me, a circulation of 18,000 out of a population of, of 5 million here. So they found out uh, about, um, and I guess next slide please, um, the, the, the author of the article, article here found out about, um, was interested in the, um, the work that uh, Chuck and, uh, and uh, Eric had done on exploring this, create, this crater here, okay, and now I'm gonna have trouble with this one here as well. Pinguala? Pin Pin one more time? Pinguala? Pin yeah. Okay, um, hopefully that's it for the pronunciations. Um, <laughs> So they uh, wrote an article uh, on uh, on this by, uh, with uh, with Chuck and uh, and uh, and Eric. So not nicely done. That's nice to see that uh, all across the world. You know, good job. Next slide, please. Um, a couple of things here that's uh, worth worth mentioning. There's of, of course um, dark skies. Is I mean, it's not often. You know, I mean, it'd be, be rare to have an article on dark skies and not mention uh, Rob Dick. Or um, so here is one that was recently in uh, CBC. Next slide, um, and of course, uh, mentioning uh, Rob's work on uh, uh, on uh, on preserving the night, the night sky and uh, using uh, better um, better lighting. By the way, it's actually worth mentioning here, just really quickly here, that um, we were um, about uh, two weeks ago, was it, Rob? Uh, we learned about an NCC workshop on the the, the NCC is planning on uh, illuminating some of the. Um, uh, national, uh, some of the uh, more the buildings of national significance in the downtown core. They want to have night, better nighttime illumination. So that we were that obviously um, raises alarms and so forth because what, what, what we started to think about you know uh, gaudy Vegas Strip you know uh, lighting and and so forth. So um, thanks to Margaret uh, Thompson, a member, to uh, making us aware of that. Rob attended the uh, workshop and provided input, and which will, you know, hopefully uh, influence uh, policy. But uh, from what Rob has said, um, it's uh, it, it was worthwhile attending. And by the way, Rob reminded me just before the meeting here that uh, that um, he has written a full report, and that's going to show up in the uh, in our astronauts, which is of course the members' uh, um, public um, auto center uh, publication that uh, goes out to members. So thanks, Rob, for doing that. And I've actually seen his his, his uh, re report as well, and. Uh, we're fortunate to have somebody like Rob in our, in our center, that's for sure. And somebody that can contribute to uh, influencing the, uh, the, uh, the lighting in, uh, in our downtown core and, and preserving it at least, uh, that ain't sky in some way. Okay, uh, next slide. Actually, by the way, one other thing I should mention as well is um, I sent out a note to the group about uh, astronauts uh, and how I was totally impressed with it. Um, 
I, I, you know, I, 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 this is an, a volunteer effort to come up with the, uh, the, the, new, the newsletter. And, if you, and I remember uh, when, I, when I read it, I was thoroughly impressed with the content. Again, that comes from members and the, the organization. So um, Karen, I don't think you're here tonight, but I think you're sick. Uh, you're not feeling well, but um, once again, a, a, amazing job. And Karen will, of course, always remind me that, to say that uh, it, it all depends on members uh, contributing to, uh, contributing to the, uh, their, their articles and the ideas and so forth. Okay. Um, I think it's over to you, Neil. Uh, Neil Rollins is going to give us a 10-minute astronomy news update. Yeah. Okay, well, good evening. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me to do this. I always enjoy putting together uh, the latest news from astronomy because there's always a lot of great news. Um, let me see here. How do we advance the slides? There we go. <laughs> Just say advance it. <clears throat> so the, um, I thought it would be really important to, um, uh, to highlight here some a recent discovery, which actually called into question a previous discovery announced in, yeah, announced in March last year. It um, is, has to do with the cosmic microwave background, and this is an image from the Planck mission that is busy mapping uh, the microwave background across the entire sky. Here it's projected in a kind of an unusual form here, but um, trust me, this is, this, uh, is one projection of the, of the, of the sky that the, uh, anybody would observe as you scan the entire sky. And what you see there is actually uh, the temperature differences or fluctuations that are, uh, that's in color there. Um, that uh, basically, the, everywhere you look, the universe is at uh, 2.7 Kelvin, which is a couple degrees above absolute zero. But uh, some places where you look, there's a tiny fraction of a temperature difference. And that is very interesting because it tells us something about the, the earliest possible moments in the universe. I'll get into that in a, in a minute. I have about five slides just to explain and put into context these results. Uh, so hopefully it's, uh, it's not too uh, rushed. The, um, I should mention, I think Al Scott's giving a presentation on, uh, on uh, cos more, more in depth on cosmology. So this type of thing will be discussed more next month. But uh, I just thought it was important to highlight you know, the progress of science. We prove some things, and then we disprove them and check them. And, and uh, every time we put a new telescope on the sky with more sensitivity, we get, um, we get uh, a new view. So the new view, actually, if we go forward one slide and then back, this is the slide, this is what Planck released in 2013. And it is just a map of the temperature fluctuations with the blue being colder and red being hotter. If you go back to the other one, I don't know if you can see it, but there are now lines, squiggly lines drawn all over that map. And that is a map of the polarization of the, of the uh, emission, the cosmic microwave background. And that is a piece of new information and it's never been done for the whole sky. And the results that were announced uh, in back in March were just a piece of the sky. And because they only had a piece of the puzzle, they made some wrong conclusions, which are now, uh, now corrected. So if we go forward two slides, just a brief history of the universe here. <laughs> we have uh, the beginning on the, uh, on the left. And we have this period called inflation. This is the best model we have so far. The universe basically expands from this singularity into, uh, or extremely rapidly, like uh, 10 to the minus 32 seconds, so extremely fast. And nobody thought we could actually, when this was first proposed, no one thought we could actually observe that. But um, it turns out that it does leave a signature, and that signature will show up later. If you can look through the diagram, when you get to 38,000 years, three, sorry, 380,000 years, you see that little stripe of color? That's, that's where the cosmic microwave background comes from. That, that point, as we look back in time, as we look deeper into the universe. So, um, but imprinted on that were these temperature fluctuations. But also the polarization tells us something about this inflation, inflationary period. Sorry about that. So, um, but you'll see in the diagram below, uh, the middle one, underneath the 380,000 uh, years, you see the um, the polarization occurring when the uh, when this cosmic microwave background light was first emitted. But uh, that would be great if we could observe it just like that. However, we have to observe it later on 
when it's traversed through the rest of the universe as it's you know, aging, and we have to look through dust, and that actually polarizes the light more. So unless you correct for that, you're going to get the wrong answer. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a, a tiny subset of the uh, fluctuations in, in the microwave background observed by Frank Planck. And then this is just trying to explain the next few diagrams, which are, this is like a power spectrum where certain fluctuations of certain size, if, if, there, uh, if there are many of them, then you'll get a large bump like that first one. And that shows you the angular scale on the top. So there's a lot of structure in the cosmic microwave background at a level of, uh, you know, just under a degree. And then these other bumps tell us more. And this was some earlier results, actually, from other missions. But if we go on to the next slide, the uh, excitement last year was that the, uh, the uh, BICEP-2 array, which I think is that little dish in the middle, this is the South Pole telescopes, um, it basically detected, you'll see in the green plot there, this other bump. And this is now a bump in the polarization of the microwave background. You want to use a laser pointer? Sure. Is there one? <laughs> I don't think we got it there. Okay. It's all right. I think we'll manage. So this, this diagram here is just to show you the kind of, you know, those lines on the, on the Planck uh, plot that you saw. BICEP only saw a tiny piece of the sky, a few fluctuations, and then you could tell from the swirls you could decide what this level of B-mode signature is, and that's this bump. And then everyone got really excited, because this, this bump meant that we would be seeing the signature of that inflation, and it would be about the strongest signature predicted by all the theories. So that got all the press, and everyone was excited. But on the next slide, keep this plot in mind, you'll see the old data there in black, but now Planck observed the same region. It got its own map of swirls and corrected for the dust emission of the galaxy, this little bump sort of went away and fits this red curve now uh, without the bump. So it means that inflation wasn't as strong as it, you know, the maximum that theory can predict it. It doesn't mean inflation's not there, it just means that we're gonna have to look harder to find it. So, and it's uh, interesting, I thought that the people who published the research first in March uh, actually collaborated with the Planck people doing this research to produce this graph, which uh, basically debunked their own results. So that's great. That's the way science should work. OK. Sorry, that's uh, the longest bit. I have a couple more news items that I thought were interesting. Uh, there were two things in nature just this past week, if you want to go forward. So the first one has to do with the formation of the, the Earth and Moon system. So the theory since the 1970s is that a Mars-sized body smashed into the, uh, the basically molten Earth early in its formation and, um, and produced as, uh, basically a combined, the cores of the planets combined, and then all the debris left over circled the Earth for a few million years and then coalesced to form the Moon. It nicely explained why the Moon has a lot of light elements and is very similar to the Earth crust and mantle, kind of the outer shell of the Earth, and is depleted in iron. So the, the iron that was in this planet you know, mixed with the Earth formed that bigger iron core. And uh, so I just think it's very interesting. It's a great, uh, great theory. It stood up for a while, but as more and more models came in, it was being called into question in the last few years. Anyway, so the new results kind of overturn that. More detailed modeling has shown that, you know, they take thousands of planetesimals. Computers have gotten a lot better. They can model this many more different scenarios. And they've found out that, no, indeed, if, if a collision occurs late in the planetary formation, then you will get planets, like essentially a double planet forming the Earth-Moon system. It's almost a double planet. So that's uh, progress as well, but progress in computers helping out uh, astronomy. Next uh, slide. <clears throat> I don't, if, anyone, if you're not familiar with the ALMA array, this is the other item appearing in Nature recently. This is submillimeter telescopes in the Atacama Desert in Chile. It's an uh, amazing telescope because it can do extremely high resolution, angular resolution imaging. And in fact, this is the dust disk around a nearby star, MWC 480. And they're actually detecting very complex organics in there, not dissimilar to the complex organics we see in comets in our solar system. So this is great. This is basically like detecting 
the, this is an artist's conception, but basically detecting uh, the, basically the comets around another star, which is, uh, I think, really cool. And it tells us about the building blocks of life are present you know, throughout the universe, as we've been suspecting. So next slide. Um, <clears throat> had to mention this one because on Monday, Prime Minister Harper announced that Canada was contributing $243 million to the, uh, the 30 meter telescope. It's going to be built in Hawaii. It's 30 meters across. It's built like the Keck telescope. It's going to have many little segments. Canada was actually participating for a number of years in this project, and the Canadian community was try hoping very, hard, very much that this would get funded, and it basically kind of did at the 11th hour. So uh, the TMT project gave Canada another, another year to basically come up with the money, and uh, just in time, it did. And so now we're part of the, gonna be part of the world's largest uh, telescope. Uh, and it seems to be the furthest ahead in terms of uh, construction and getting things going. So Canada will have a, basically a 20% share. There are other countries in like China and India for 10% each. And then it's mostly, the rest of it is uh, University of California, Caltech, the California University system. Can you describe what share that is? Like, what does that mean, 20% share? Well, it basically means 20% uh, of the time the dome is open and, and doing science, Canada gets 25 or 20% of that. So one night out of a week, or, well, five-day week, <laughs> or, you know, however you want to divide it up. Usually it's divided up in light time and dark time. You know, like when the moon's out, it's not as good. So you... Um, you know, you get 20% of that, but you also get 20% of the dark. Okay, the next slide just shows some of the, uh, oh, I, sorry, go back one. I just should mention $150 million worth of that contribution is going into this beautiful dome here. It's going to be built in British Columbia. Um, the company that does it also happens to build many amusement rides, such as uh, Harry Potter at, uh, at Universal Studios. So, um, so that's good for Canada and uh, good business for them. The next slide shows another contribution. The other major contribution is going to be this thing called nefarious, which actually means a narrow uh, field infrared adaptive optic system. And it is actually going to stabilize the, the stars, the seeing, for multiple instruments which bolt on the side here. And this gives you an idea of the scale of it. It is absolutely massive. This is another instrument, believe it or not. <laughs> It'd be like a train car. So the next slide gives you an idea of the size of Nefarious. And this is some of the structure holding it. And so it's a very complex instrument. It has various wavefront error sensors and laser guide star sensors. And like I said, it's going to stabilize the light for the other instruments. Next slide just shows the cutaway, I think. If we hit, uh, is there a next slide? Or part of, yeah, there we go. Just. Uh, shows you the light path buried in that structure. So pretty exciting. Uh, Canada gets to contribute uh, that and work on instrumentation as well as uh, do the science with the telescope. And I apologize if I've gone over, no, but thank you. Actually, I got a question for you. So, so Neil, will the um, 30 meters uh, telescope also have adaptive optics, or is that sort of the default now that comes with uh, any new? Uh... It's pretty much the default now. Yeah, everybody wants it or needs it. And they either do it with a, like a facility instrument like that that will support multiple instruments, or the adaptive optics is actually built into each instrument. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. So. Any other questions? We, uh, we, yep. we have a good time. Did I understand you to say that the work on the lunar origin is, is, is working, it's, it's trying to demonstrate that it was not formed by a collision? Uh, no, no, it was. Um, it wasn't quite focused like that. Um, that particular work was basically modeling the early solar system, and putting enough planetesimals in there, and they interact enough times uh, to build up, to form Mars, to form Earth, and then it's in the late stages where things kind of happen, and you have to run many simula simulations if it's a, a relatively rare event, right, to show, and then and then you'll find out well. Uh, and then it forms the collision. Then it forms the collision, yeah. Okay, any more? Okay. Okay, terrific. Okay. Ah, actually, there's one more question, sorry. Okay. So the telescope, it's not optical at all. It's purely computer-driven, like... The, the TMT? Yeah. Um, 
Well, it, it's, uh, there's kind of multiple levels of stabilization. We talked about getting rid of the twinkling, but before that, all those segments, just like the Keck telescope, which is currently working in Hawaii, all the segments are uh, computer controlled to bring them into alignment. And, um, and so that process goes on no matter what, as the telescope tilts, it's actually on an alta az, sorry, <laughs> on an alta az mount, and, uh, and, and then they have to worry about wind loading and everything else, so the system is designed to correct for all that. Thank you. Perfect, thanks, Neil. Thanks again, Neil. Um, Neil, I should have told you this uh, just before you started your, uh, your uh, presentation. I actually had learned uh, just in your presentation that um, one of our speakers here, his car doesn't, uh, one of our presenters, Tim Cole, his car won't start. So he's not able to uh, attend and, tonight and, and deliver his presentation. I'm kind of hoping he's going to surprise us and somehow manage to make his way here. But uh, because I was really looking forward to his uh, celestial navigation presentation. So a bit of a disappointment, but these things happen. So. We're going to um, we're going to shift uh, shift things around a bit. Um, what we were planning to do after the break, Jim Thompson's presentation on um, uh, um, uh, the, of the mapping of the moon and the lunar study, we're going to actually shift that to right now. Okay, so um, with that, um, let's go to Jim's uh, presentation. Thanks, Jim, for coming. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Um, those of you who know me um, know that uh, I'm a bit of a lunar nut. Um, I really enjoy observing the moon, uh, imaging the moon, but I'm also fascinated with um, sort of the history of how mankind has related to the moon. And um, I'm tonight going to talk about the photographic lunar atlas, and I hope to share with you my appreciation uh, for this body of work that has been done by uh, scientists that came before us. Uh, next slide, please. So serious study of the moon began shortly after Galileo uh, looked at the moon for the first time with a telescope uh, in the early 17th century. And since then, most of the efforts have been associated with mapping the moon and uh, naming all of the features. And that's a field of study called selenography. No, little or no research was done in all of this time up until the mid 20th century on the actual structure of the moon, how it was formed, and the geology. In fact, up until uh, quite recently, a large number of scientists still believed that a number of the craters on the moon were of volcanic origin. Uh, next, please. After World War II, the U.S. increased research in rocketry and other space sciences, uh, dependent mostly on all of the German scientists that they were able to, uh, to scoop up out of uh, post-war Germany. But the research wasn't really very well organized, uh, wasn't very consistently funded, um, so there wasn't really a lot of progress made. But this all changed when the space race was officially kicked off on October 4th, 1957, with the USSR's launch of the Sputnik 1. Next slide, please. The US President Kennedy, who was in office at the time, he was not about to lose the space race to the USSR. Uh, some of you may have seen the video that we played at the beginning of the meeting. That was a speech given by JFK in uh, September of 1962. And there was actually probably a more important speech that he gave in front of a joint session of Congress. It was given a year and a half earlier, uh, May 1961. And uh, I'll just read the one line that I find is kind of captivating. Uh, First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Well, as we well know, the U.S. public and, uh, more importantly, the U.S. Congress bought into JFK's plan. Uh, next slide, please. 
So with this new commitment to landing a person on the moon before 1970, scientists and engineers were sent scrambling. It was suddenly brought to light how little actual information US scientists had about the moon. With less than 10 years to go, one of the first things that had to be done was to learn as much as possible about the physical makeup of the moon. Luckily, there was funding available to back all of the research that was suddenly about to begin. Uh, next slide, please. And this is where the hero of the story comes in, Dr. Gerard P. Kuiper. I'll read you, uh, since we apparently have the time tonight, I'll read you a Wikipedia entry uh, about Mr. Kuiper. Kuiper, the son of a tailor in the village of Harens, Harens sorry, I don't read Dutch very well, Haren Karspel in New North Holland, had an early interest in astronomy. He had extraordinarily sharp eyesight, allowing him to see magnitude 7.5 stars with the naked eye, about four times fainter than visible to normal eyes. He went to study at Leiden University in 1924, where at the time a very large number of astronomers had congregated. He was befriended by fellow students Bart Bach, Pieter Osterhoff, and was taught by Elnir Hersprung, Anthony Panakok, Willem de Sitter, Jan Walter, and Jan Oort, and the physicist Paul Achenfest. Some of those names might be familiar to you. He received his Bachelor of Science in Astronomy in 1927 and continued straight on with his graduate studies. Kuiper finished his doctoral thesis on binary stars with Hertzsprung in 1933, another name you may recognize, after which he traveled to California to become a fellow under Robert Grant Aiken at the Lick Observatory. In 1935, he left to work at the Harvard College Observatory where he met Sarah Parker Fuller, whom he married in June 1936. Although he had planned to move to Java to work at the Bosche Observatory, he took a position at the Yerkes Observatory of the University of Chicago and became an American citizen in 1937. In 1949, Kuiper initiated the Yerkes McDonald Asteroid Survey. And uh, during the Second World War, he actually took a sabbatical and served with the Radar Countermeasures Division of the 8th United States Air Force based in the UK. And then at the conclusion of the war, he joined the US uh, War Service to um, assess German technology, see if the US wanted to keep any of it. And at one point, he went on a daring um, raid into East Germany to rescue Max Planck before the Russians got him. So some exciting stuff. Uh, some of his scientific achievements uh, include the discovery of the moon's Miranda around Uranus and the moon Nereid around Neptune. He discovered that Mars had CO2 in its atmosphere. He also discovered that Titan's atmosphere was rich in methane. He pioneered the idea of putting an infrared-based telescope aboard an aircraft and flying it in the stratosphere to do astronomy. He also was the first to suggest that there's a ring of icy bodies outside the orbit of Neptune, which we now call the Kuiper Belt. He was involved in the development and was the second and fourth director of the McDonald Observatory, which is in Texas. Um, he took that uh, control after his good friend Otto Struve retired. And he spent much of his career um, teaching and working at the University of Chicago. One of the graduate students he had at the time in, includes Carl Sagan, who you may have heard of. A uh, very fascinating man. And I think we could probably get a whole uh, talk just on, on him because there's much, much more to dig into on this man. So uh, next slide, please. So in 1960, Kuiper decided to leave the University of Chicago and he came to the University of Arizona in Tucson he came to Tucson in search of more freedom with his research and to take advantage of the new uh, large observatories that were starting up in the U.S. Southwest. Upon arrival, he founded the Lunar and Planetary, Planetary Laboratory, a community of scientists dedicated to solar system studies, including study of the moon. 
Up to this point, he actually hadn't done any studying of the moon. It was all uh, planetary work. One of his first tasks for the LPL was to publish a comprehensive series of lunar atlases, the purpose of which was to give researchers a common basis for lunar research. Uh, next slide, please. So in all, Kuiper's group published four atlases. The namesake, the photographic lunar atlas, followed by four supplements, the last two supplements being published, published in a single atlas. Uh, next, please. So the first atlas, called the Photographic Lunar Atlas, was published in 1960. It was a collection of lunar images uh, from the face of the moon divided into 44 different fields, uh, covering the whole near side face. The images were selected from thousands and thousands of already existing photographic plates from Mount Wilson, Lick, Pic de Midi, McDonald, and Yerkes observatories, collected between 1901 and 1959. So you can imagine how monumental a task that was. I'm sure his graduate students weren't very impressed. So the atlas was issued as a box of 212 slides, each 17 inches by 21 inches in size and black, in black and white. His idea for the large print size and the number of different fields was to encourage their use directly at the uh, telescope. Uh, next, please. The first supplement is called the Orthographic Atlas of the Moon. It was also published in 1960, and it showed the best photos from the previous atlas with a rectangular grid overlaid to allow for the accurate location of features. This atlas was published as a folio-style book with 29 pages of 18 by 21 inch prints. Uh, next, please. The second supplement was called the Rectified Lunar Atlas. It was published in 1963, and it showed images of the near side of the moon divided into 30 fields, as viewed from directly overhead. Now, this was accomplished by projecting the existing lunar photos onto a three-foot diameter sphere and then re-photographing from the appropriate position. And you can see an example in this picture right here. So this is a, a reflective sphere, three feet in diameter, and there's a projector off screen to the left, projecting a, a photograph that was taken from an observatory. And then here's the photographer. I don't know if that's Whitaker or not. That was one of the... No, it's Hartman. Is that Hartman? Yeah. Um, setting up to take his, his image of something direct from directly overhead. Quite a clever, uh, clever way of doing it. Uh, next, please. Jim, it's worth pointing out that's how they discovered what Mari Orientalis actually really oh, looked like. You're getting ahead of the program here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never tell you to shut up, Simon. Um, next, oh, we have the next one already, okay. Uh, so the last two supplements were published as a single atlas called the Consolidated Lunar Atlas. It was published in 1967 in the form of a boxed set of 227 prints, uh, 17 by 21 inches in size. The images for this atlas all came from a systematic re-photographing of the moon at higher resolution than had been, than had been achieved up to this point. And all that work was done by uh, Kuiper's graduate students as well as some of his postgrads um, from the new facility that had been built at uh, Catalina Observatory as well as the U.S. Naval Observatory. Uh, next, please. Well, Kuiper's lunar atlases, uh, even though out of date from our standpoint now, um, they were important because they provided a much needed foundation at the time upon which researchers could, could start from to, to build, build their own research. In the course of publishing the atlases, the LPL developed a number of new technologies as well as a number of, uh, oh sorry, uh, new technologies including that method of rectifying images from a, a sphere into uh, a flat. Uh, as well as a number of different techniques for reproducing in a large format, which didn't really exist at the time. Um, 
the quality of the photographic prints that they could make at that size was poor. They didn't have the resolution that Kuiper wanted, so they had to kind of reinvent a way, a printing process to do it. Um, the lunar research that the Atlas has supported, as well as all the other work of the LPL, was quite important in the success of the Apollo program, because it really was the starting point for all of the detailed analysis and research that was done. And it also resulted in a number of direct discoveries, um, the main one being the one that Simon mentioned, where the, uh, the mountain ridges on the, uh, the western side of the moon, from our perspective, just look like mountains. But when they were reprojected to be looking from effectively overhead, it was clear that they were rings from a basin. And that's when they discovered the, the Orientale basin, the multi-ring basin. The uh, one thing that is surprising is that these atlases are actually still in use today by some, some places. Um, certainly Astronomy Magazine, if you read the, um, the lunar observing section in the middle of the magazine, the images that they use are from the Consolidated Lunar Atlas. The Lunar Wiki online, they often use images from, from the Consolidated Lunar Atlas, as well as a number of books and other online articles will quote images out of these atlases. So they have the long legs these atlases have. Uh, next, please. So if you wanted to buy one of these, where would you go? <laughs> uh, nowhere. They're not really available for sale. These atlases are long out of print, as you can imagine. Um, finding print copies is very difficult. Most are hidden away somewhere in a university library or in a professional observatory somewhere. Now, there are uh, electronic versions available of three of them. And I've, I have links up here for the, the first one, the third one, and the fourth one. You can get online. And if you can see me, or um, we can post this uh, after if anybody's interested in, in the links. Um, if you're lucky, you can find print copies available to buy online from time to time. That's where I, I got mine. Uh, just by chance, I came across them. Um, but they are relatively expensive because they're rare. And um, the last two, the Rectified Lunar Atlas and the Consolidated Lunar Atlas, I have never seen in print anywhere. Um, so I've actually, for my own um, appreciation, printed them out myself and had them bound, uh, but only printed half size because printing them full size, even today, is quite expensive. Um, at the end of the meeting, or I guess now it can be during the break, uh, you're welcome to come over and have a look uh, and ask any questions you have. I have all four of the axes over on the table here on the side. Um, uh, next slide, please. So in summary, I personally regard these atlases as a very important piece of history. They were published at a time when serious scientific study of the moon was just beginning and were an important stepping stone along the way to putting a man on the moon. These atlases are also a reminder of the long heritage of discovery coming from Gerard Kuiper and uh, the people who worked at uh, Lunar Planetary Laboratory, which continues to this day. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions uh, for, uh, for Jim when he's here? Is that Gene Shoemaker on the left in that photo? Simon, can you see from there? Uh, see, the, the images are so young, it's really hard for me to recognize the faces, but it's... Well, you can look on the monitor here, Jim. Because he was quite active in, in uh, training the Apollo astronauts for their uh, lunar excursions. I think that's Gene Shoemaker. You're, you're talking about the dark-haired man standing on the left? Yeah. This man here? Yeah. It's, it's possible. Uh, Kuiper, I only really touched on a, a minimal amount of what this man did in his career. It was uh, amazing what he was involved in. So the, the number of scientists in the field that he worked with is, is staggering. So it's entirely possible that he's worked with Schumacher, or Shoemaker, not the race car driver, <laughs> Shoemaker. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah. Jim, have you ever read, is there any reference to Dr. Elbaz? 
he was known as Dr. Lunar. All the astronauts who had received training from him because he was the man who was the acknowledged <coughs> expert on the moon at the time when they were getting the Apollo astronauts trained up for the moon. Is, uh, is he figured in the history of the Atlas? Have you found? I don't recall ever seeing that name associated with, with this work or with the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, but, you know, there was, the way the U.S. went about the Apollo program was uh, kind of an exercise in uh, delegation, because the, the U.S. Air Force is actually the government uh, institution that managed the development of these atlases. All the funding came from the Air Force. And a lot of the previous work that Kuiper had done, even during World War II, was with the Air Force. Um, but there was other branches of the government that was doing research, like directly from NASA. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things happening simultaneously, um, like the, the lunar uh, rover mission and the, um, I forget the name of the, the probe they put up to image the moon. I forget the name of it now. Um, that was done in the late 60s. It, it was done by yet another group in the U.S. They're usually centered on some university that has a planetary <coughs> research program. And you know there's a lot of scientific data in those photographs. Uh, I was thinking about all the new impacts that have happened since then that we can detect by, by examining the old photographs and comparing, and comparing them to the new LRO photos. Uh, have you heard anything about that if they're being used that way? I, I haven't. Uh, that's not to say that it isn't happening. I know that um, it, that would the scale of that kind of a exercise is pretty large, and uh, for the funding that's available now for planetary studies, I think it's the best they can do to get images, download them, and put them up on the internet for the public to see. And that's about it. <laughs> so if we could all download them. We could go. It, it could be a citizen science type look thing. See, oh, yes. Look, there's a new crater. Now, it is interesting to note that the resolution of the images, even in the Consolidated Lunar Atlas, which you can see later, is uh, not as good as I get now from my 10-inch scope in my backyard imaging. So it's kind of a curious side note how technology has advanced in the last 40 years. Jim, I got a question for you. So, sure. so Kuiper did this work in the mid-20th century, that day, right? So um, 1960s, 50s, 60s? This, yeah, he had a career leading up to the war and a little bit up till like 1960, and it was all double star related. And that's what he did his PhD thesis on. And then he kind of got into infrared detection. Uh, that's when he did the, the aerial surveying, um, putting a telescope in an aircraft and flying it. And uh, when he discovered the atmospheres in Mars, that was using infrared sensing technology. And then it was when he, he must have just said, ah, I've had enough of Chicago. I'm going west. In 1960, and he totally changed his field of study to planetary study. And I guess he just wanted something new, something different to do. So we've been looking at the moon for, for over 400 years, I mean, with telescopes, right? So I mean, was there somebody before him that, uh, that uh, was serious about um, looking at the uh, features of the moon and mapping them? Well, of, uh, certainly there was scientists who were interested in studying, you know, how the moon formed, what's the nature of the features that we're looking at, that sort of thing, um, but not with so much drive and uh, purpose to that study and the funding. <laughs> it's a big thing. A lot of times, um, you, you kind of self-funding, or it's just a university doing their own research. It's not really guided by anything. So the the Apollo program really injected a lot of funding into lunar research, and it really gave it a kickstart forward. And certainly the, there was some actual science accomplished in the Apollo missions that the step before, and it wasn't all just a PR stunt to, uh, to show off the Russians. So that, that whole program really kicked it off to where we are now. Okay. Any other questions? Russian lunar atlases. They must have lunar atlases. The Russians? Yeah. Uh, they kind of gave up on the near side, but they have a far side atlas. When they had, the, they were the first to see the far side of the moon. They had the probe uh, to see the far side, and they immediately uh, published those results in a hope of getting an upper hand on the U.S. And of course, the U.S. said, "Well, we'll put a man on the moon. How about that?" 
Thank you. Well, well th thanks, Jim, for that. I mean, uh, before we take our break here, and it, um, I just wanted to say a couple of announcements. If we could go to slide number, that's the one. You read my mind. Um, so, um, as, uh, as as Jim said uh, during the break, he's got, he has his uh, the atlas is uh, out. Uh, for, for showing, so you can ask him questions at the table at the right at the side here. I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about, particularly for the people who are near here tonight, um, about some of the benefits in our in our in our club. Our club has a uh, a telescope loan library, which I'm very I'm very fond of. I actually over a decade ago, I actually used some of these some of these telescopes, and since then, there's been more and more telescopes that have been that have been added to it. Almost 15 years, actually. Um, we have a library, and by the way, it's the library, which has been stuck at the Canada Science and Technology Museum for various reasons, is, uh, has actually now been moved, um, actually I think even tonight, Estelle is, is uh, moving it to a location behind the, um, the theater here, so it'll be accessible again. I don't know if it's going to be tonight, right Estelle, are you here? I think she's actually putting books away um, as we speak behind us, but uh, um, I bet if you had a question, she, she probably wouldn't mind, so if anybody has a question about the books or would like to take a look at them, um, um, she would probably uh, entertain the question. So, um, we, we also have a Fred Lossing Observatory that is, uh, is um, uh, available to members. We're going to be talking more about that. There's a tour, in fact, tomorrow night. Next slide, please. Uh, with your membership, you get uh, six, uh, a, year, year, a year subscription to Sky, to, uh, Sky News Magazine, uh, an R electronic edition, to, uh, edition of the uh, RASC Journal, okay? and an observer's handbook here. And I wanted to show this here. This is actually the 2015 handbook that, um, that came out. It's uh, obviously very thick and packed with a lot of uh, reference um, material. This is an accumulation of work of over 100 years, actually. They keep adding to it and so forth. But um, those of you who use this quite a bit will probably notice something different here. This one was actually, uh, um, this is Bob Hilliers. And he actually had it, um, um, or a ring, um, how do you say? A ring. Sp spiral bound, that's right. Um, and he had this done at actually uh, Staples uh, for, for $9. So a terrific idea. And he did it so he can uh, use it. Uh, it's easier to, uh, to work with. So, so um, good idea there. And of course, afternoons I talked about before. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so how much does all this cost here? Uh, adult membership, $72. A youth a membership, uh, uh, 43 And for families, there's a special benefit. There, there's a special rate. Uh, $67 is the base rate. First adult it was $10 more, and there was 77 And then uh, second, third, and fourth adult is 10 um, and, and another uh, $10 and, uh, and $5 more for, um, for youths and so forth. So um, I think it's worth it, um, obviously. So I think that's it for our slides here. Let's go, uh, let's just go advance two slides. Okay, so I'll leave this up here during the break here. It's uh, some other membership benefits. Uh, we're gonna be talking about some of them, um, and particularly the star parties and, and uh, other uh, what I call recreational astronomy events. And we're on. Okay, um, welcome back everyone. I know we went a little bit over, but that's okay. I mean, I, I noticed there's lots of people who are crowding around uh, Jim's table. Good job, Jim. Um, I, I was really hoping, as I said, that, uh, that Tim Cole would somehow show up for, for this uh, second half of the, of the meeting here, but to know he, he, uh, he's, he's not available. So we'll, we'll schedule his uh, celestial navigation um, presentation in uh, a month or two. We'll find, a, we'll find a space for him. We'll move, move some people around. And, uh, and uh, I'm telling you, I've seen his slides. Uh, a couple of people have seen his slides. Uh, and uh, man, he's, he's done a good job. He really has. So uh, you'll have to wait. Um, what we're going to do now is flip over to the uh, to uh, Jim um, Sophia's uh, uh, Northern Lights uh, trip report. I don't see anything on the projector. Okay, just when I thought I had to um, jump in and do something. Okay, so um, come on up, Jim. The um, I was surprised to hear a couple of weeks ago that uh, Jim was uh, going on a Northern Lights tour, and I'll, maybe what I'll do is I'll tell, tell you, I'll let him tell you how, how that came to be, and, uh, but you're going to be in for a real treat tonight when you see what he has to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. So from March 17th to the 24th, my wife and I took a trip to Alaska to see the Northern Lights. And we chose a really excellent tour company. It's called Special Interest Tours with Bob Berman. Uh, world, 
renowned astronomer, lecturer, author, and columnist for Astronomy Magazine. You may remember his excellent presentation that he gave us, I believe it was back in December, on the colors of the universe. So Bob was on hand during the tour and gave us talks uh, about the night sky and how planets and constellations and stars traverse the sky in that part of the world close to the Arctic Circle. We took advantage, my wife and I took advantage of the trip westward by first stopping in Vancouver, which was a treat because we've never been to Vancouver. And then after uh, three days, we flew to Anchorage and then on to Fairbanks, where the northern lights were known to be prominent, and they were. Uh, the weather was phenomenal. The weather was great, uh, sunny and clear throughout the time that we were there. Uh, the air was dry, and the temperature hovered around the freezing mark, give or take five or six degrees Celsius either way. So before I show you the slides of the Northern Lights, I'm just going to spend a, a few minutes just talking about some of the fun we had. Uh, the first night, we attended a lecture by Dr. Neil Brown, who, who has conducted many years of research studying the uh, Aurora Borealis. We also visited a museum at the University of Alaska and learned about the life and culture of the people there and the ingenious ways that some individuals uh, carve out a life for themselves by living off the land and preparing for the winter. Uh, quite ingenious. We saw artifacts of clothing, artwork, hunting gear, and hunting trophies. Like I never realized how big a bull moose is, but it really is. So, and, and the uh, polar bears were, were, were really large, nine, 10 feet high. From Fairbanks, we traveled by bus to China Hot Springs. And uh, there must be some magical minerals in the water because when I submersed my body in those hot springs, I felt instant relaxation. We learned about how the hot springs were used to generate electricity and uh, to grow organic foods. We went on a dog sled ride. Of course, we're in Alaska. <laughs> and I learned how passionate those dogs are to run. They really love to run. And when the race was over, and it was time for new dogs to be hitched to the, to the sled, you would hear all of this howling and barking from, it must have been close to 80 huskies begging to be uh, chosen to uh, pull the next, uh, uh, the next sled. We stopped off at the Alaskan Pipeline, which is an 800 mile pipe traversing north to south of the state. We also saw magnificent ice sculptures, which reminded us of home. We went on nature walks, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to take the extended package, which involved board boarding a train from Fairbanks to Anchorage. And I have a couple of uh, photos to show you. Uh, the mountains, the, the, the wildlife, the terrain, it was just, I was just in awe of the uh, spectacle. So it, it was really well worth uh, uh, the trip. Uh, one of the slides you're going to see is of Mount McKinley, which is the largest mountain peak in North America, over to, to, uh, 20,000 feet. So I'm going to be showing you some slides of the Northern Lights, and uh, it really doesn't do justice to the experience because, you know, the way I can describe it is that the, there was a, a great variation in intensity. There were some times when you'd see just narrow bands of light. There were other times when the light was truly very intense and covered most of the sky. Uh, there were also periods of movements. Uh, and it, it was really like a show. Uh, and it, of course, evoked the oohs and ahs from spectators, including, including myself. 
So the northern light, uh, Aurora Borealis, originates from solar activity. The solar wind containing charged particles travel towards Earth and strike the atoms in our atmosphere, which then excite the electrons in those atoms to higher energy states. And when the electron returns to its original lower energy state, it gives off a photon, or light, which then is influenced by uh, the magnetic field lines. So being close to the Arctic Circle increases your chances of seeing the aurora. And uh, Fairbanks just happens to be in that band. So uh, we, we were really fortunate to get an excellent show. Also, uh, something to know that there are different gases in the atmosphere that give off different colors and that accounts for the different colors that we see. So for example, uh, oxygen at low altitude, uh, being 60 miles, uh, gives off green, but at higher altitude, say 200 miles, it gives off a reddish hue. Uh, nitrogen, uh, I'm told, gives off a bluish and, and also a red hue as well. The shots that I took of the, of the aurora were taken by a very inexpensive little camera. Uh, I, should have brought, I should have brought Eric along. He would have blown us away with his, his good work. Uh, it's an inexpensive uh, camera. Uh, it's a Canon power shot. And I experimented with the settings and uh, found that the best setting that worked was uh, setting the ISO at 1600 and taking exposures lasting between two and four seconds. Okay. So next slide, please. So th this is the vehicles that uh, took us up to the mountain. And let me tell you, it was a rough ride. OK, next slide, please. So this is uh, an example of, of one shot that was taken. And m maybe what we could do is just show the shots maybe in six or eight second intervals. Can we turn the lights off, please? What really impressed me was uh, the intensity, but also the form. The microphone? That's okay. also the form that some of these, uh, uh, some of the aurora took. And here you could see the horizon, and it almost looks like someone's out to. That's a nice shot. You can see there is definitely some grain in these photographs. So Jim, can you say something about your exposure time and your ISO? Yeah, the uh, ISO is set at 1600, and the exposure time was between two and four seconds. Uh, there was, the, the, it depends. The, like that changed an awful lot. Uh, you know, you'd see it would move. Sometimes it would just stay that way. It was very unpredictable, just like nature being very unpredictable. You're going to see in a second. Yeah, and we're going to show uh, a video as well that was taken by uh, uh, Bob's daughter. That, I believe, was taken right up at the zenith of the sky. Oh. oh, sorry about that. I was wondering what that noise was. <laughs> the northern lights. The northern lights, yeah, I believe it, I believe it. There we go. Why is oxygen one color at one altitude and that that, that's a really good question. I, I don't know. I don't know, but I, I, I heard and I read, it, read up about that, and that's, that's what I read. Maybe someone else can answer that question. It's an excellent question. Did you see any red? Yes, there, were, there, there was red. 
a bit, not as much as green, but there was red. Does that screen do justice to those photos? Uh, yes, because that's what they look like. <laughs> this is a better one. That's a nice one. Maybe we can hold that. Yeah. Okay. And now I have a couple of shots of the, the train ride. If you go to the next slide. So this, this is a mountain uh, I took right from the train, uh, traveling from uh, Fairbanks to Anchorage. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, McKinley Peak. And fortunately, we, and it's the side of it, but, but fortunately, because the, the weather was so good, you were able to see just about the top of the mountain. But often, you're not able to see that there are clouds that get in the way. Next slide, please. Okay, there was, yeah, there was one other shot, but I, I guess that wasn't there. Okay, so um, I understand that there is a video uh, that, that was taken, which will give you a little bit more action. No, it's not that. That's the Bob Berman video? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my this God. This is really great. Committing video of this. And actually, I can take a. It's yeah. real time, no acceleration. Yeah. That's with a high quality camera. That's a nice color too. It's got some nice fringes. Yeah. Fringes here. yeah. What was the temperature? Oh, it must have been about minus six Celsius. It was very comfortable. The air was dry. It was great. We're right underneath the curtain. Look at this. And there was a hut you could go right, in and warm right yourself up, have hot chocolate and whatever. Oh. Not even in a mess, because I have to change the whole camera no, setup. No, no, don't, that. don't. Just, just drink <laughs> it in. Just drink it in. I mean, look, look at you, there's a, a This ripple. was taken by Bob's uh, uh, daughter. So she had a really expensive camera. I'm not sure what kind of camera it was, but it's... I tried to do the same thing with mine, taking video shots, but... Uh, you need to increase the exposure time to really capture the light. But look at that, isn't that magnificent? And that's exactly how it looks. Just letting this run so that they can get the subtle changes. Is there a way you can take video at lower, you know, like lower, fewer frames? <laughs> um. In other words, if you took a, a shot every half second, Instead of 16 a second. It wouldn't look that well, good. Well, I've lowered it to JPEG from RAW. So yeah. I'm already doing what? Yeah. But, uh, you know, but a regular video, you know, you need what? 16 or 24 You know, I probably second. could, but I don't really want to mess with it right now. Just because. See that? I don't want to be on the menu. I want to be enjoying it. And sometimes this would just arc right across the sky. That's, that's how amazing it was. It, just, it was just pervading the uh, area. We can see something at the bottom there, reddish, red at the bottom of the screen, on the left side. What is that? Wow. Uh, it's, it, it would have to be part of the aurora, because there were, I don't remember uh, any lights. I tried taking, I tried taking uh, video. But um, what I realized is that when, when the exposure is short, you just don't get anything. So I had to go with individual shots from two to four seconds. If you increase it, it's overexposed and it doesn't really represent what you see. So anyway, I had an awfully wonderful time and I'm glad I was able to share it with all of you. Any more questions before? Uh, I got a question. Yes. Was this typical of most nights? 
Uh, yes, it was. So do we read from that that the astronomers in Fairbanks don't get to observe much in the way of deep sky objects? <laughs> I don't know when. I, I, there may be a season for uh, the aurora. I'm not quite sure. But uh, I was there for five nights. And out of the five nights, I would say four of those nights was, uh, you know, had the same intensity. Uh, there was one night when it was, there was always an aurora, but it wasn't as intense. You didn't see the U as deeply as you, as you, as you did uh, just now. Uh, it's, 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 I was also told that uh, this was the best aurora in Fairbanks in close to 10 years. So uh, we were just really lucky. And it's kind of nice to know, you know, uh, astronomy is like a crapshoot when it comes to weather and everything else. But it's nice when things go well, and, and it did. So any other questions? All right. Thank you. Yes? If our, if our atmosphere were bait, was mostly neon, what color would the aurora be? <laughs> well, neon is... Isn't neon part of the um, uh, constituents? Yeah, I I don't I don't really know what's. I, I discovered this about a year ago, just reading some haphazard article. Yeah, let's deflect it back to the uh, the group here. If the atmosphere was all neon, what would the uh, what would what color would be? Uh, uh, so uh, Richard says orange. Orange. How how do you know? Uh, what there must be some. Uh, I think a neon tube is higher pressure than what you have at those altitudes. Because a neon actually blow at all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so Jim, if oxygen, if oxygen can give two different colors. Yeah. Neon, right? Yeah. Depend on its density and the So Jim, would you do it again with Bob Burnham? Oh, definitely. As a matter of fact, uh, Special Interest Tours has uh, some really amazing ventures. Uh, there is one that's coming up in November, uh, Chile, the Atacama Desert, and I'm seriously considering it. Uh, what you get is not just looking at telescopes optically, um, and I'm talking about really high quality telescopes because he has connections there uh, for two nights but you also get to visit other observatories and uh, also visit islands where you see penguins and wildlife and all sorts of things. And again, uh, there are many activities involved. So it's astronomy, but it's also uh, checking out what uh, the area has to offer. So I, I've really had a wonderful experience and wouldn't, and I would strongly uh, you know, recommend uh, checking out uh, at the I'd love, I'd love to go. I've been wanting to do this for many years. All right. So, anyway, take care. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Okay, so let's move on to our observer uh, uh, reports. I think first up is uh, if the uh, um, observers could uh, come forward. I, I think Paul Clowinger is uh, not going to be able to make it tonight, so his images we'll share and video actually we'll share at the uh, at the next meeting. So. Jim and Eric. Okay. Um, this was an image I took of the moon uh, just a day past the first quarter um, back on Saturday, March 28th. And I thought it was relevant to show tonight because this is pretty close to what we're going to see on um, April 25th which is Astronomy Day. Can uh -huh. we kill the lights, please? Lights, can you kill them again, please? Yeah, Ah, great, thank you. Um, yes, Astronomy Day. We're gonna talk a bit about that uh, a little bit later, but uh, I thought I'd give a little uh, heads up to everybody of what to expect on that day, uh, assuming that it's uh, clear that night. So uh, this is a great, uh, great phase. There's a lot of interesting things to see, starting at the north end. Um, actually, it's really hard to see on the screen here. But uh, Alpine Valley is a great target to, to have a look at, as well as Plato. Um, 
a good challenge is trying to find the Rima in the middle of the Alpine Valley, which is really hard to see, but uh, it's kind of a fun challenge. Uh, next, one of my favorite craters is um, Cassini, or the happy face. I don't know if you can see the happy face there. Smiley, nose to eyes. It's one of my favorites. Uh, followed by the Apennine Mountains, very prominent. Uh, they have very stark shadows, uh, lots of uh, nice detail to look at that range. And of, in the middle here somewhere, if you're lucky, you can pick out the Hadley Reel, where um, one of the Apollo missions landed. Uh, continuing south, we go through this region, um, this darker region, which um, scientists think are uh, pyroclastic deposits. So this is like ash ejected into, into space and then falls back with gravity. Uh, much uh, darker makeup to the regular lavas. And then in the same area, and unfortunately you can't really see it at this resolution, but the Hygienus rill, or sorry, it's Re Rima Hygienus. I have an explanation for that straight line that goes across there. What, what could that uh, be? <laughs> hey, do you have a license for that laser pointer, sir? <laughs> I use it for my lectures. <laughs> Um, that is actually under contention. Some people think that it's because of Tycho, but you'll note that it doesn't actually, at least from our vantage point, doesn't seem to line up. Now, this is something that has traveled around, like basically in orbit around the moon and landed. So it may be ejected from Tycho, or it may be ejected from something up here in the north. Scientists are in a disagreement about that, but it's, it's ejecta. It's a newer material uh, thrown over the, a darker Mar region. Um, there's some uh, great examples here of hexagonal craters uh, for Simon. I know he loves the hexagonal craters, so they're fun to, uh, to check out, a whole cluster of them in this area. And then, of course, it's uh, great to finish off with uh, Unfortunately, the, uh, the gamma on the projector is a bit dark. Right there, I don't know if you can see that line. That's uh, Rupus Recta, the straight wall. And then just on the other side of Burt here is uh, Rima Burt. It's, uh, it's another valley, which is more challenging to see than the straight wall. But another fun target to try to pick out. And then, of course, uh, Tycho is always a great target to show people, to give them a sense of um, if you describe the size of it and what they're looking at and how young it is, comparatively young, uh, it's, it's a great target to share with, uh, with the public. Uh, this, uh, if you're interested to know the background of the image, there's, as you might have guessed, this is five frames that I've mosaic together. Each frame is a stack of 250 images out of a capture of 2,000. So there's a little bit of post-processing here to get this shot. Jim, there's also the, uh, the, 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 the partial ring around Nubium, you can see there, which is illuminated. Can you see it down, d d down nearest the first dog leg? Nearest the first, like here? Oh, no, no, other, the other one. There we go. Oh, you're talking, uh, oh, here. There you go. Yes, yes, yeah, you can actually make that out. You can actually see that feature through a large number of phases because it's uh, quite tall. So yeah, you can see that uh, feature quite prominently. Um, okay, next, please. This was an image of Jupiter captured on the same night. Uh, same camera, same scope. So it was a 10-inch Richie Kretchen scope that I was using. Um, I kind of cheated a bit on this image. It's two exposures, one a bit longer to get the moons, and then one shorter to get to good contrast on Jupiter. Um, but I'm kind of happy with the way it turned out. So this is, again, 250 frames out of 2,000 stacked in wavelets in Registax. Um, I was kind of lucky. Um, nine times out of 10 when I view, the, view Jupiter, the great red spot is nowhere to be seen, but it just happened to be making its way around when I started setting up, so I was lucky there. And uh, this is one of the first times that I've actually got a good disk for each of the moons. 
the seeing is so terrible in Ottawa, they usually end up as uh, diffraction spikes. But tonight, oh, this particular night, I got uh, a nice disc, and you can actually, uh, maybe not here, well, maybe you can. You can see that's kind of brownish, that's Ganymede. This one's fairly white, that's uh, Europa. And then this orangish one is Io. So I was pretty happy with that. It was supposed to be uh, below average seeing and actually ended up being not too bad that night. Uh, next, please, final one. This was an image that I took on a Good Friday. Um, being home from work was a great opportunity to do a little solar observing. It was a nice sunny weekend we had. Hopefully everybody got out to have a look at the sky. Um, so this is uh, three different wavelengths. Um, calcium K at 395 nanometers. Um, solar continuum, which is around 540 nanometers. And then uh, H alpha at 656.28 uh, nanometers. Uh, these two were collected using a, a, a 98 millimeter refractor with um, a Herschel safety wedge on it with uh, appropriate filter. And then this was a, a, a different scope. This was a 66 millimeter refractor with um, H alpha etalon and blocker added to it. And the main thing to note is that um, based on my evidence, we are in the solar minimum. As you can see, there is a sunspot right there. That's it. A yeah, little black speck right there. That's the extent of the sunspot activity presently. It's fairly quiet. Um, that being said, there still seems to be some good filament activity and some good prominences. So if you do have an H alpha scope, it, it is worth hauling out uh, to have a look if you get a chance, even if it's for a half an hour or whatever. Um, yeah, it's a interesting, and what, what I find fascinating is these features change within minutes of you standing there watching them, which is kind of neat. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So um, one thing I forgot to mention, Bob, we, Bob Olson, we, uh, we actually do have your slides in the pack here as well, so um, uh, you, you can come up as well. And Eric, why don't we go to you and me next? So Eric LeMay. Thanks, Mike. Um, so the, my first image here tonight, um, this is a Comet Lovejoy again. I took this actually before I took the previous Comet image that I showed you guys, uh, I guess two months ago now. Um, and I took this with a 5D Mark II with a 135 millimeter uh, lens. Uh, I believe this was just eight shots of 125 uh, seconds long. It just caught my eye because it was close to uh, 1045. Um, we have a, the next slide here, please. Okay, so this is a um, another uh, time lapse sequence that I uh, worked on, and I guess it was in December. Um, or sorry, no, this was it was uh, January 13th actually. So we'll, uh, we'll look this through here. This was uh, 30 second long images. Um, well, okay, that's kind of weird. There we go. Um, so this is about uh, eight hours worth of exposure from start to finish. Let's just play that again. Um, I was toying around with a new uh, time-lapse device that I've got that has a light meter on it, so it can actually measure the sky background and, and vary the, uh, the exposure length and the ISO accordingly. So if you're trying to go from daytime to nighttime, that allows you to start off and, and you know, you, you basically expand your dynamic range so that you can get a proper exposure during the daytime and go straight into night. Um, and if you notice right here, we've got uh, the comet. Eric, yeah. bring it back to the beginning of the video. You'll see the guy with the lights at the beginning of the video. Yeah, that's another thing I wanted to, uh, to mention. I couldn't see that with just my... Uh, that's weird that the way it's not playing like that right from the start. I guess we'll just wait for it to loop. Actually, if you push the uh, loop button down here, it'll just automatically loop. So you should see them like right about here. Yeah. I, I couldn't actually see that visually, so it surprised me when I saw that. Um, 
being in January. Right, always points to where the bleeding's occurred. Right. Um, the light pollution that you see here down at the bottom, um, and we were talking about little small towns probably, that's uh, got to be well over 100 kilometers away. You, you can barely see that uh, from Teeple's Hill. So anyways, um, if we could show the next uh, slide here. The, uh, the next one I have is the Rosette Nebula. Um, and I took this with my narrow band, uh, the three nanometer narrow band filters, uh, combined exposure of four hours long. Um, what I really like about these narrow band filters is that you can, uh, you can image right from the, the middle of the city. So I, I live just north of the Canada Centrum right now. And I mean, you wouldn't even dare, uh, you know, even using a telescope visually, visually in, in that area because it's just so bright you can't see anything. I'm, uh, I mean, the, the 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 whole area has uh, LED lights now as well too, so it's it's becoming a, a real problem. But um, but these narrowband filters seem to go pretty much straight through it. I did have a problem with the um, with the the sulfur channel uh, because the sulfur uh, or the, the light coming from the sulfur channel is is very dim to start off with. So whereas the hydrogen alpha uh, light was easily able to overcome the, the uh, I guess the noise you could call it from the, 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 uh, the light gradients um, so that you, you barely see it in that channel, it was actually evident in the sulfur channel. That, that surprised me. With a, uh, with a three nanometer filter, I would have thought that you could pretty much image from anywhere. But I guess that, that uh, pretty much is true unless you start getting light sources that have a, uh, a broadband uh, output spectrum, which I guess some of these LEDs are starting to. So that's all I've got for uh, tonight. Actually, if I could mention one more thing, uh, a few of you know, I've been going up to the to Teeple's Hill. The, the, uh, in the middle of January, when I, when I went up there to take uh, this photography, you know, the snow was two feet deep. And, you know, snow would be coming over the, the hood of my Xterra and, you know, it was one big adventure getting to the, to the top, right? And I figured this thing can go anywhere. So uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I was going back there. Just uh, I just brought my tripod and my, my uh, camera. I was gonna do time lapse again. And uh, the snow had melted a little bit. So there's a, a crusty top to the snow. And I had made it up to the driveway to Teeple's Hill, no problem because the snowmobiles had packed down the snow, pretty much in, in two wheel drive as well too. The, uh, the one part I had to switch it over into four-wheel drive was when, uh, when we hit the, the steep part, which is probably about a 20% gradient. Anyway, so we, we got to the, uh, to the driveway, and I figured I'd uh, try to go right up in there. Of course, you know, I was right up to the axles in uh, pretty packed snow, and so I made a few attempts to, you know, I'd reverse and, and go at it again. And of course, on my last attempt, I wasn't watching where I was going when I was going backwards and put a, a wheel into the ditch and got stuck, like the kind of stuck where you're, you're well past where a tow truck can, can get you. You can pretty much leave the, uh, the keys in the ignition because you don't know it's coming. And I, I don't think I've panicked too much in my life before. This, this time, you know, panic sort of set in a little bit. Um, you know, it was minus 18 and we were well out of reception for, uh, for cell phone reception. And, you know, the fear kind of crept up that, well, man, this might be, uh, <laughs> I might be in for the long haul. So anyways, I, uh, I was with Graham, hey, we, we, uh, we hiked for a bit, finally found cell phone reception. The reason why I want to mention this is because I managed to, to get in, in touch with uh, Paul Cloninger. It's too bad he's not here tonight, because I really wanted to thank him again. He drove for two hours that night, at, starting at midnight. He got there at, uh, at, at 2 a.m. And, uh, and got me out of there. And uh, so I'm pretty grateful for that. I had, I had to hike about two kilometers back to the road just to be able to get to the point where he could get me, but he got me out of there. And uh, so I spent the night at his place and in the morning he drove me home. Uh, subsequently, I, you know, I, I had to leave the truck there for a week before I finally managed to get uh, friends back. Mike uh, Mogadam came up with, uh, with myself. Uh, I went with uh, another guy, uh, Eric Lafontaine, and I brought my parents along. And we, we finally dug the thing out and, uh, and came home. A few of them, though, they wanted to go further up the, uh, up the trail, and I kind of thought, no, I just want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, my thanks goes out to everyone who, who uh, helped me get my, my, 
my chuckle and that, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll be forever grateful. Thanks. Let me tell you, when I saw that truck up there, I yelled out, who in, who in the world would drive up that steep slope way out in the bush, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know, that's, uh, that's Eric, <laughs> but uh, he got his truck out. Uh, Bob, are you here? Yeah. Um, all right, so Bob, we didn't mention you earlier, but... Uh... I don't think I need that. I should, I should comment about uh, the uh, Northern Lights I'm from the Northwest Territories. I, was, I spent my childhood up there, and we saw them all the time. And I just recently found out at Starfest this, uh, this past summer that um, if you conceive a child under the Northern Lights, it's a good luck. I, I find that when I'm, like, old. It's uh, not, not useful. The other thing is, uh, somebody asked about, maybe Simon asked about observing in the North. north. Um, the, the winters are dark, dark all night. The Northern Lights drive you crazy. That's, that's true. But it's minus 50. And then in the summer when it's nice, if you're not getting eaten alive by bugs, uh, it's daylight all day. So the north is a terrible place for telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, can you cut the lights here? I, I look better in the dark. Um, I spent the winter in Florida, sort of like the weather you guys had here, <laughs> except better. Um, we rented a house, uh, we rented a house on uh, a little lake uh, south of Orlando. So this is looking south, which is wonderful. Uh, Orlando, the lights of Orlando or north. We still have terrible light pollution, but still not too bad. And this is taken from about where I set my telescope up. Okay, next slide, please. And that's the lake in the background. Uh, you can see this little six-foot band is where I would set my telescope up. Okay, next last slide. And here I am, uh, actually this is, I'm taking some images of the comet and we're looking at it with binoculars. Um, the lake is four feet away and it has alligators in it. <laughs> and it's, you know, like normally, we don't have a flash, it's pitch dark. Uh, the locals tell me that alligators don't eat people in the winter, it's too cool. But I have to tell you that I, I, I sort of paid a little attention when I was out there. Okay, uh, I have a, I, I just made myself a 12-inch telescope, a nice imaging Newtonian, and uh, was all excited about taking it down to, us, uh, to uh, Florida with me to image all winter. Uh, we were there for, we were at this house for 60 days, and I imaged uh, probably 24 of those nights. The weather was wonderful, balmy, 15-degree winds blowing on you, really nice. And then I found out the telescope wouldn't fit in my car. <laughs> a little tactical error. So I loaded a, an old 8-inch on, on my mount and uh, found out that I couldn't counterbalance it. <laughs> so I MacGyvered a hammer on the rear end of it with duct tape <laughs> so that it would balance. Is that for the alligators? <laughs> That's right. You'd think to yourself, well, why doesn't he just bring the telescope back a little bit? But I didn't have enough room on my mount to do that. It was, I had to. So I want you to tell you, though, that I did take the hammer off and replaced it with a brick later. <laughs> okay, next slide. Yeah. Uh, big C clamps work very, very well for that as well. Which does? Large C clamps. Yeah, yeah, I'm in Florida and I caught at a rented house. I had nothing. I had to take that brick out of my neighbor's laneway. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first image I took, and you know, you just you just set up your scope and find something in the sky that you can actually find. And uh, Orion's uh, nebula is just a real easy target. Um, if you look carefully here, uh, well, I can't see it, but do you see uh, the uh, stars in the middle there? Do they show up in your picture? No, uh, anyway, that's a, that's, a, that's a one second exposure. In here, one second exposure. Everywhere else, four hours. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, yeah, uh, this, is one of my, this is one of my favorite targets. It's just absolutely fantastic uh, to, to, to image uh, the horse head. A couple of things about it. We were talking about uh, the color of lights that are, are smacked by radiation. I, I believe it's one of the bright stars lighting this up with uh, uh, ultraviolet and, uh, and, and uh, agitating the hydrogen 
alpha uh, gas that's there, and it glows this red. The hydrogen alpha actually extends all the way up in through here. In light pollution, I just can't get it. Uh, another interesting thing is these blue hazy parts are stars, uh, which are uh, blue because of the reflect. Blue is different is is preferentially reflected by uh, by uh, dust, and those are dusty areas. They're exactly, really, basically the same reason our sky is blue. Okay, next. Uh, this is the same comet. I got this comet on, uh, I think, January 27th, and uh, I didn't. I could. I didn't know where it was, so I just centered it up in my picture. And, uh, you know, I didn't see this at all until I processed it later. Uh, you know, it would have been a lot better if the comet was up here and a big long tail coming off it. But uh, this is the same picture that uh, Eric had, except way more magnification and probably more time. I think these are four-minute exposures, and I might have ten or so of them for this. And uh, that would bring up the question of why are the stars not big blurs? And what we have here is actually two sets of images. I imaged the stars, and then I imaged the comet separately, and then put the two of them together. Uh, so while this image was being taken, this, the comet, well, actually the stars probably moved about this much. Okay. Bob, I've also noticed that the uh, tail is pointing in the other direction. Uh, From most of the other pictures I've seen, the, the tail Oh, is yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, it's a Newtonian, and so we've got funny reflections. We have uh, two reflections coming off it. Uh, I have no idea which way up is on this thing. This is, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Okay, next one. Uh, this uh, picture here, uh, I saw lots of images of this. And this is the uh, Mars and uh, Jupiter, I'm sorry, Mars and Venus uh, when they're really close to the moon. When they, and you can see that's, the, the moon is half a degree about, so it's pretty darn close. Uh, and it was sort of interesting. I showed this to people, of, uh, friends of mine who are not amateur astronomers, and they were all astonished at the Earth shine on the moon. Uh, which was pretty visible that night. Um, I guess the interesting thing about this is, is that I, this picture was taken in Florida, which is, a, uh, so that explains the palm tree, but the, uh, this is a stand your ground state. I don't know if you guys get this in the news a lot, but basically if you don't like somebody, you can shoot them and tell them they were threatening you. Uh, it's a little disconcerting wandering around the dark at night uh, with uh, cranky neighbors. And to get the palm tree in the right spot. I actually had to trespass on my neighbor's, uh, my gun-toting neighbor's backyard. And I was just a, <laughs> way more, he's way more dangerous than the alligators. <laughs> I'm sorry? The same neighbor donated the Good point, no. <laughs> but I, I, well, one thing I would say about this is this is not a telescope picture. This is just my camera uh, mounted on a tripod. And uh, you can see the incredible amount of noise in the background. Uh, this was a, a pretty short exposure. OK, next one. This is the same picture Eric just showed you, uh, except it's in invisible light. I used red, green, and blue to get this image. And uh, as he pointed out, it is really a, a spectacular uh, uh, sight when you, see it in a tele you know, when you see it on an image. It doesn't show up that great in, when you look at it with a telescope, but it really is a spectacular image. And again, these stars in here are exciting. All this hydrogen gas around. And uh, you know, it's mostly hydrogen alpha, so uh, Eric trying to do sulfur, you wouldn't get much. But uh, it's still just, to me, it's a, f a fabulous target. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, actually, we would have had some slides from uh, Gary. My apologies, Gary. We'll, we'll slip them in for uh, your images in next month. Um, folks, I want to pick up the pace now. We're going to talk about a couple of um, uh, announcements on the, uh, various events and, it, and also an, uh, an update on uh, flow as well. So if we could go to the, um, is it 167 slide? The first slide with the uh, Millican tail, uh, please. Yes. So. Um, at this time, uh, Pat Brown, I think many of you know Pat Brown, she, she runs a, um, a, a very uh, a nice program of uh, uh, introduction to the uh, night sky. And um, she, over the next uh, three Friday nights, actually including, this, including tonight, um, is, uh, she's uh, offering a, a, a both uh, indoor and outdoor uh, events. So if it's, uh, 
If it's uh, cloudy, she's got an indoor program. It's at the middle of Kintail here. Um, and uh, if you uh, want to find out more, you can phone that number, or you can also see Bob Hillier, uh, who's here tonight. So if you want to come up after the meeting and you want to say, oh, I'd like to talk to Bob about this, um, I can uh, introduce you to Bob. But it is in the uh, middle of Kintail, and, and, and uh, Pat is, uh, runs a very uh, organized program and you'll walk out of this, uh, out of this uh, and it is, by the way, a, a free uh, program. I think she looks for a, uh, a donation, uh, uh, but she doesn't, um, I think, demand a, an amount. But um, Pat always does a nice job. Next slide, please. Um, Gordon and Ron, why don't the two of you come up and talk about, uh, about Flow and uh, the, the Flow Tour. And, uh, and, and Ron uh, St. Martin, the director of the Flow, is gonna, Fred Lossing Observatory, is going to give an update on uh, on uh, the plans for flow, at least share some preliminary thoughts. So. Bob, could you increase the uh, light levels for the podium, please? Increase the light levels, please? Yeah. Okay, so the uh, nice FLO tour nice <laughs> nice um, is set for tomorrow night. It looks like it's going to be really clear, so we're going to go. And uh, so anybody who signed up for the February, which got postponed till March. Uh, you're welcome to come. And anybody who signed up for April, of course. I've already got about six or eight people who've confirmed. And so if you haven't confirmed, uh, just so we have an idea, it would be great if you could send me an email. OK, but that's tomorrow night. I'm going to be there for 5.30. And we'll have, so that can give us a couple hours daylight to see the facility, see the scope, and so forth. And then we'll have a star party afterwards and go till about one o'clock. Okay? Thanks. Hi, for you guys that don't know me, my name is Ron St. Martin. I'm the director of the observatory. I will not be there tomorrow night for obvious reasons. It's my 50th birthday tomorrow. Thank you. I'm shocked that I made it this far, but here we go. Um, we have some plans for this summer. Uh, we're actually building uh, another observatory on the site. So we had an 18 inch telescope uh, donated to us. So it's gonna, and we're gonna try and build it in a two year project, basically trying to do it right. So it doesn't uh, collapse like this one does. But um, we're gonna be building it pretty much down on that other slope right beside the mound. So it's gonna be another 10 by 10 building which will house an 18 inch telescope. And uh, we'll be doing other uh, projects this year, like painting the roof, which needs it badly, and uh, doing some renovations on the building itself, rewiring, uh, maybe putting a new gate this year too, if we can, uh, if we can afford it. But uh, the main project is the observatory, and um, from time to time this summer, I will be calling out for uh, for volunteers. So if anybody uh, feels like wheeling a pick or a shovel and Feels like having a, if they have a free day to come out and help out, uh, it'd be deeply appreciated. And uh, oh, the uh, Millican Tell actually, the conservation area is actually going to top the trees off because uh, I know we did that about 10 years ago and we got in a big pile of doo doo because we were not supposed to do it. And we cut everything down and just left it like a big jackpot all over the place. But uh, they didn't seem too kindly to that. So they want to do it themselves, which is saving us a lot of trouble. Um, anything else? Oh yeah. Also, um, the uh, the guys at the Millican Tell also uh, informed me that um, when you're when you're coming in the gate at the observatory, there's a field behind there, and then there's some bushes, and there's another field, and there's a group of um, uh, mountain bike enthusiasts that have uh, gotten access to that field, and they're going to be coming through. The observatory, as you see the, the trails from the Millican Tell, there's one that comes right around the observatory. So they're going to be using this in our access road to gain access to their field. And uh, I told him, I said, well, that's not going to be a problem. But he told me that they're so hardcore that they go out at night sometimes. So if that becomes a problem, if anybody's out there and you see bikes going by with lights and it's disturbing you, let me know. And I'll let them know. And they'd offered to cut a new road in to avoid the observatory for us if it becomes a problem. So if anybody has any problem with that, let me know. So that way we can take action on that. And Ron, yeah. I had a question. Is the internet service available at uh, Follow? No. Not, 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 that, not that you would be providing it, but has, has it been mapped there? Have mm -hmm. other people, people been using it? No, not at all. So actually, actually, at all? no, I don't think so. No. 
if you're standing about here, you have cell service. Yeah. Or if you're standing here, you don't. Or, or, if, you <laughs> think, or if you think the great big step ladder that's in there, set it up around here. Stand right at the top with your hands free thing and you're falling up like this. You get half decent reception. So it's not too bad. You gotta be able, you gotta have pretty good balance for that, but you know. on the note of uh, cell reception, um, I will be there if anybody's coming out and you get lost or you're not sure where you are or not sure where the gate is, call me. Uh, about eighty percent of the time it goes immediately to voicemail and uh, I will call you back. That's happened a couple times in the past couple of months of so the previous attempts we've had. People have called, it's gone to voicemail. Um, but I will call you back. And the other thing is um, finding the place. If you're coming out of Almont and you're heading down Highway 29 towards Pakenham, you'll see a sign for the Mill of Contail, Clayton Road. It's a left-hand turn right beside the, uh, what's his name, Naismith house. That's not the turn. It's three kilometers, almost exactly three kilometers further on, on the left, and it's Benny's Corners, which is a left-hand turn, and you can actually, what's on the right-hand side, do you remember? Anyway, it doesn't really matter, but it's, Bush. it's Benny, no, no, there's a, there are a couple of houses, and it goes oh, down okay. to a housing development, but it's a left-hand turn, and it's the first left-hand turn after Clayton Road, yeah. okay? You'll go up, it's a dirt road, it goes up a little bit of a hill and keeps working its way up. There's a house, a house or two on the left, a little log cabin on the right, you'll pass an observatory, and that's Pat Brown's house on the right. And it, then the road curves around to the left and then starts to curve back to the right. And you're going up a bit of a hill and the gate is right there on the left, okay? If you come to another intersection, you've gone too far by a about a third of a meter, or a third of a kilometer rather. You can, you can yeah. take Clayton Road too. Yeah, you can, but you've got to come all the way back around. Yeah. It's, it's confusing, just, or is yeah. Is there a big barn just outside the, uh, the gate? No, it burnt down about uh, five or six years ago where there was an arsonist that was going around Elmont burning barns. <laughs> he burnt that barn, so <laughs> that barn is no longer there. Yeah. Jeff had a question? Yeah, my email to you, I asked if you had the geographical coordinates I just picture somebody here for the first time yeah. wandering off in some direction, not to the observatory. Um, I don't have them, but if you Google it, right, if you go to Google Maps and go to the satellite view yeah, image and, and move in on the Mill of Contail, oh, yeah, you you'll, you'll see it. It's very easy. Yeah. And, and you'll yeah, you'll see the Mill of Contail, but you won't see flow. Yeah, you will. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. You can see the observatory and the building. It'd be nice if, if there was a sign right off Benny's Patterns Road that said FLO. There is a, there is a little sign, and, and little, it's about this big. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's right on the gate post. And, it, and it's crooked and because it's, one of the screws yeah, broke off. Yeah. So, so it's, instead That's of being crazy. FLO like this, it's like this. Yeah. Okay. So when you drive, just go like this. But you, you can see it, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yep. When, when does the uh, renewal for the keys? Oh, yes. Yes, the renewal will be next month in May. So I'll have the keys available here during the meeting and after the meeting. So, And uh, as usual, it'll be $35 again for the year. And that's about it. Is there any other questions? If you have any other questions or comments, you can see me after the meeting too. I'll be, I'll be sticking around for a while. Yeah, and I'll be checking my email if anybody wants to send me an email. I'll be, I'll be checking it probably about 3.30, and I'll be leaving around 4 to head out, so, okay? And I'll be having dinner by then. There Thanks, you guys. Go. Ribs, I hope. Birthday cake. Oh, yeah. Okay, next one, slide. Thanks, guys. Okay, real quick, because I want to wind down fast. Um, so, a couple of things. Our star party, our, our uh, program is, uh, star stargazing program is starting up next week, so weather permitting, um, we'll be holding it at the usual spot, which is the, uh, the parking lot of the CARP branch of the Ottawa Public Library. So that's in CARP and close to the CARP fairgrounds. If, uh, it's uh, open to everyone. Um, no need to be a member, no need to bring a telescope. Just, just come and enjoy the night sky with us. I like that we're doing it early this year because, um, uh, well, obviously the, uh, the, the, the uh, sun still uh, sets relatively early and the, uh, 
and the mosquitoes aren't around to yet to enjoy the uh, evening with us, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice time to do it. Um, next slide. Um, and uh, all this, uh, if you uh, go on our website, you'll see that where, where it's located, and you'll see this map. And, um, and as I say there, it's, this is, uh, this we observe in the uh, parking lot, there's actually three, uh, three levels here. Down here would be the uh, carp fair, and uh, of course, um, I'm pointing off screen, <laughs> the 417 would be much further south than the Canadian Tire Center and so forth. But it's, it's easy to find. And um, the other good news I want to say too, as well, by the way, is that um, we do have, an, uh, you may remember seeing some emails from me uh, looking for uh, coordinators and site, site, uh, site supervisors, if you want to call them. Um, Mike Garvey, he's going to be the, he is the uh, star party, he's volunteered to be the star party coordinator, so he'll be sending out go, no, go notices and, and working with people like Gary Bolt to, um, to help promote uh, the, um, through the media. The, uh, the star parties, and we have a number of site coordinators. Uh, Richard Alexanderich is, is one person, Richard Harding, Graham Hay, Gislan Cerise, Paul Sadler, uh, Mike Garvey, and uh, one that might surprise you who says he's going uh, to do this um, in September, if things work out for him, is Mike Wirfs. So he's signed up for that. So next slide, please. Okay, like I said, uh, this, uh, I think many of you know the way this works here is we have a primary date. So uh, week today, if the weather holds, we'll be announcing a go no go um, through our email list and the, on the, on the on, and on the um, and on our post on our website. Uh, if it happens to rain um, or if it's cloudy skies, we go to the uh, the eighteenth. Uh, after that, there won't be any more events uh, scheduled for the month. And of course, we do the same thing in May. We only have one event per month. Okay, so the first clear night we get, that's it. All right, so um, it should be a nice program. Next slide, please. Um, International Astronomy Day. Jim, if you could come up as well, please. Um, so there's two really big events, okay, um, that, at the, um, the uh, celebrating International Astronomy Day just over two weeks from now. The, the first one is run by um, uh, the, the uh, Museum of um, the, the Museum, and this year it's being, it's being held at the uh, Aviation Space Museum. And uh, they've invited us, in, as, in the, as, uh, the, as, in the, as they have in, the, um, in previous years. It's usually been at the, at the Canada Science Technology Museum, and of course now it's this, this year at the Aviation Space Museum. It's an important event for the REC to attend. So if you're a registered REC Museum volunteer, um, we, could, we could use uh, your help and, uh, to, to, uh, to support uh, daytime solar observing, to support um, evening, um, e evening stargazing. They, they're going to have the portable planetarium that's uh, set up indoors. Uh, lots of giveaways. Lots of uh, some, there's some craft events, and I was just reading about this actually just a couple of hours ago. And um, it's it's a, it's a it's a big event. Now I want to, um, Jim's going to talk to you about another next slide, please. Another huge event, which I also encourage you to go to. And, and it's by the way, it's totally organized by this fellow here, so it's very impressive. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Yeah, I, I can't take all of the credit because... Uh, yes, you should. No, I, I just am the guy who's collecting names and, and making sure that everything gets done. But um, the, Some of you may be aware that there's a, another uh, fairly active group in the Ottawa area called the OAOG. Uh, a lot of the members are actually uh, here tonight, also uh, members of RASC. Um, this year will be the 15th year, 15th consecutive year that there has been an Astronomy Day event hosted by the group. It takes place at the, uh, the chapters at Silver City, where the, the shopping mall there. Uh, terrible place for a star party, obviously because of the, the lights, but uh, the, the objective is to bring astronomy to as many people as we can, and what better place than uh, a shopping mall? Um, there's a movie theater there, lots of restaurants, so the, uh, the through traffic of people there is great. We get so many people off guard just, hey, what are you doing with a telescope in the parking lot sort of thing that um, in past years we've had uh, several thousand people come through and um, observe through our volunteers' telescopes. Uh, so very much like what's happening at the museum, we're going to have uh, volunteers setting up their scopes during the day to look at the sun and then at night to look at uh, the moon. Uh, we expect uh, Jupiter and Venus should be prominent. We may catch Mars before it sets, I'm not sure. Um, but it's usually a big event. Um, we have lots of displays and handouts and, and things for the kids. We encourage uh, families to come out and check it out. Um, so um, I encourage people to promote these two events. Uh, we. We really are trying to grow an interest in astronomy and science in general. 
Um, so if if you want to come to either or both, you know, you're you're, you're more than welcome. So if you want more information, uh, please go ahead and contact me at the uh, the number at the bottom or uh, the email. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. That's it. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, like Jim said, these are just uh, two wonderful events, and and and, um, and definitely uh, I encourage you to go to uh, either or both. Okay, really quickly here, there's another event that I want to give you a heads up on. On May 16th, we've been um, we're we're partnering with Blue Gypsy Wines to offer uh, uh, stargazing at at, at uh, in, in in this location here. Uh, it's also in support of a, um, a charitable event, and I've forgotten what it's, uh, it's about right now. But Prajish uh, will be sending out the details of, about this um, in um, in the coming weeks. Next slide, please. Um, I'm dragging my feet on organizing the next telescope clinic, and I apologize for that. But uh, remember, we we offered one just before Christmas, where we uh, uh, people brought their scopes, and we had lots of ha uh, hands on um, on. Um, uh, support. We did call me a lot of scopes, so I'll be announcing that in, through email in the next couple of weeks. I've been looking for a location. I haven't found an ideal one. We just may go back to the place we had before, but um, it was a. Uh, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be posting it through our email list uh, and also on our website. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the uh, Stan Mott Library, that's our astronomy library, is here uh, now. Uh, Estelle was setting it up earlier tonight. She doesn't have anything she can show. Um, but uh, next month it will be available for signing up books and, and so forth. Um, another membership effort. Next slide. Next slide. Right. Okay, just to wind down here. Um, One more announcement. Oh, I know, I was just going to mention that too. No, no, you can go ahead. Come on up and go. Right. That's right, Gordon. I saw it. <laughs> uh, you might have noticed earlier on the benefits of membership list that Mike had up, um, discounted rates on magazine subscriptions. Well, for the past, I don't know how many years, Steve McIntyre's been doing it. Um, but one of the magazines has recently changed their procedure on how to deal with it. And because of his hearing issues, he, he can't do it on the phone. And faxes are something he struggles with. So we need a volunteer to take on the position of our magazine coordinator. So if anybody wants to do it, you can either contact me or Mike. And uh, we'd, apparently it's not too much work. He said they're only about uh, about 12 times a year that you have to interact with it, with the magazine. So okay. that's it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, we meet after this. Uh, there's a social event after this uh, meeting. At, uh, it's at Perkins, not far from here, on the um, corner of Saint Laurent and, and, uh, and Ogilvy. Uh, everyone is welcome to attend. Next slide. Um, this meeting was uh, it was being webcast and is recorded and. Um, and uh, you notice it shows up on YouTube. And by the way, I, if you haven't uh, checked out the YouTube videos of, um, of these meetings, I really encourage you to. Eric has done an outstanding job with these YouTube videos. Eric, this, you really are amazing. Okay, terrific. All right, terrific. Well, you did a fine job with uh, Haley Sabers. Uh, that was just a, I mean, they're all like this, she, but. I, I can't take credit, it's her. She, she did great. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, I, I enjoyed it. I watched it uh, probably more than once, actually. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and again, through our website, you can click on these links and it'll take you to a YouTube video. Okay, next slide. Um, I, I, I don't know, I think we must have had over 100 tonight, thanks to all the uh, participants and uh, people who contributed to it, and, and Chris uh, Tarrant, although he's not here tonight, he did a huge amount of work. I can't tell you how much he did. Um, um, so interesting. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. Next slide. Uh, we meet um, on uh, Friday, May 1st. Uh, actually, David, it's not May 8th, it's May 1st, I told you May 8th. Um, and uh, same place. Next slide. And we've got a botanist. Uh, from the, um, the Museum of Nature, who's going to be uh, talking about his experiences on a um, Mars um, simulation, okay? Uh, and um, and uh, Al Scott, I've, uh, Al Scott is going to be presenting a uh, sort of reviewing the the, the, uh, more, the important uh, discoveries in the last decade. Um, he's going to take stock of all of them and. Uh, and uh, share his perspective and, 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 and help put it all together. Okay, uh, it might be a challenge, but I know he's uh, uh, he, not, not a challenge for Al, that's for sure. Next slide. 
Okay, that brings us to the end. Uh, so thanks everyone. I'm gonna, we're gonna run the door prizes right now. I'm gonna call out the tickets, but that's the end of the uh, internet, internet broadcast and thank you all.